I'd like to welcome everybody to the Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future. Uh, my name is Tony Genetis. I'm the director here. The, the, center, uh, the center's mission is to uh, understand the forces that determine the evolution of uh, human societies and the forces that uh, lead to, hopefully, lead to improvement of the human condition um, over time. Uh, as part of that, uh, we have a lot of uh, people who are interested in environmental issues. And when Edward Cunningham in the Department of Earth and Environment told me a couple of months ago, he says, I know this guy. I know this great guy. He needs to come and give a seminar. Um, and sent me all of, all of uh, Bob's uh, uh, information. My immediate response was, oh, you mean Bob? Well, of course I know Bob. Because I knew Bob from his uh, stint as a AAAS fellow at the Department of Energy uh, when I was still with the National Laboratory System, where he was working on issues like social cost of carbon and, and uh, working in the DOE policy office. Uh, so we corresponded, and, and we were lucky to be able to get him um, as part of a, a, a mini speaking tour of the Northeast. Uh, to come up and talk about some of his work, uh, uncertainties and risks of regional sea level changes. So, Bob? Great. Thank you, Tony. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at, at BU and at the um, Pardee Center. Um, and I think at the Pardee Center in particular because, as I understand the mission of the Pardee Center, it's on understanding the longer range future. And one of the big questions that motivates a lot, a lot of my work is the question of how we sort of integrate the fact that we as a society are making decisions that have the decisions themselves have time scales of you know quarterly decisions, business cycles, election cycles, but their impacts on this planet can last for a very long term. They can last for, in some cases, tens of thousands of years. So I think one of the key challenges of the 21st century is the one that I think is related to the mission of this institute, this center, um, which is how we reconcile these two time scales. So, as Tony was saying, um, you know, I met him when I was working at the Department of Energy on climate change policy. My career has been somewhat meandering. Um, if pressed, I would probably define myself as an Earth system scientist. What that means is that I study sort of the different components of the Earth system, the atmosphere, the oceans, the biosphere, the climate, and how they interact with one another and how they evolve over geological times and over shorter time scales. Much of my work had, when I was doing my PhD at Caltech about a decade ago, focused on very long time scales, on the evolution of photosynthesis and the relationship between the evolution of photosynthesis and changes in Earth's climate. But for the last several years, I've been focusing more on much shorter time periods, more particularly on human and relationships with the Earth systems and how we're impacting um, the planetary system. But just to orient you, to look at how I think about the world, um, how many, this is uh, what's called the cosmic calendar. How many of you have, have seen or heard this sort of metaphor before? Any of you? Okay. Right. So this is a metaphor that was popularized by Carl Sagan in Cosmos uh, about 30 years ago. Um, from my understanding, it will make a reappearance in the Neil deGrasse Tyson's remake of Cosmos this year. Um, this is, in particular, is the Wikipedia version. Um, but basically, what, it's a way of understanding the scope of cosmological and geological time. So if you take the entire 13.8 billion year history of the universe and compress it into a single year, you get a calendar that looks like this. So on this calendar, or the Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago, about two-thirds of the way through the history of the universe, so September by this calendar. And my work on my thesis was largely in this period, sort of October and November. Uh, origins of photosynthesis, origins of multicellular life, origins of oxygen in the planet's atmosphere. But as I've said, um, more recently my work has basically been what would be the last day on this calendar, the last 60 some million years, and in particular a lot of it has been on the, what would be the last few minutes of this cosmic calendar, the last few hundred thousand years. So just to orient you again on this calendar, the extinction of the dinosaurs would be about one day ago. Uh, the peak of the last ice age, so when Boston was buried under about two kilometers of ice, would have been about 45 seconds ago. Um, and the origins of agriculture would have been about 22 seconds ago. Uh, and just for sort of finest scales, about 500 years corresponds to about one second, so that would be around when Columbus arrived um, in America. So that distinction I was telling you between the timescales of our impacts and the timescales of our decisions. You know, if you think about, say, a two-year election cycle, 
that would correspond to about four milliseconds on this time scale. If you think about the lifetime of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that corresponds to about a minute on this time scale. So you're talking about four orders of magnitude difference between the time scales of the decisions and the time scales of their consequences. So that's where I'm coming to this problem from. <laughs> now, I currently live in New Jersey. Um, New Jersey, like Massachusetts, is a coastal state. And I think for many of the folks in New Jersey who weren't intimately aware of it before, um, the vulnerability of coastal states to the oceans and to the effects of um, climate and weather upon the oceans was driven home uh, a year and a half ago by Superstorm Sandy. These are some pictures of Ship Bottom, New Jersey. The one on the left was taken by my colleague, Ken Miller, um, in an air flyover of Ship, of ship Bottom. Um, in 2008 as part of a um, course, uh, what we call burn seminar for freshmen he was teaching. Um, on the right is from the cover of the Philadelphia Inquirer on Halloween 2012, the day after Sandy. So they rotated 180 degrees, but as you can see clearly at the same port. And you can also see the extent of flooding, right? Basically, you know, much of the barrier island where people have built their homes was washed out, or at least fl significantly flooded um, by the storm. Now, Sandy was not primarily a, an effect of climate change. It was primarily a weather event. It was primarily an unfortunate event. It was a strong storm with a weird course that struck at high tide. And these factors together caused Sandy to cause the severe damage that we saw in New Jersey and New York City. But on this planet, we've been pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere for more than two centuries, digging up carbon that's been buried from the gr in the ground for what would be days as on the cosmic calendar and putting it into the atmosphere in the course of less than a second on the cosmic calendar. And so we've been putting more energy into the climate system, and every single weather event has been touched in some way by this additional energy. In the case of Sandy, there are three factors by which climate change may have influenced the course of the storm. So one was through temperature. Right? We can we can tie warmer temperatures pretty directly to climate change when you average over a large area. When you look at particular areas, right, there's always statistics of weather events. There's always going to be some warmth, even in the absence of any change. But if you look at sea surface temperatures the week before Sandy, um, this is the difference between October 21st, 2012, and the October average of 1971 to 2000. You'll see this area of very warm waters off the east coast of the US. So this particular set of warm waters, um, if I were to show you the map from a week later, you know, would have been mixed and disappeared. And they provide that those warm waters would be a source of energy for Sandy as it came up the east coast of the US. So that's one way climate change may have touched Sandy. Another more controversial way is related to some work that my colleague um, Jennifer Francis um, at the Institute for Marine and Coastal Science, uh, study, uh, Sciences at Rutgers has done. Um, some of you may know her. She actually lives here in Boston. Um, the uh, course of Hurricane Sandy was a bit unusual. Uh, often we have, we have storms coming up the east coast of the US and then steering out into sea. In Sandy's case, there was what's called a blocking high centered over Greenland. And that high prevented the storm from heading out into the Atlantic and steered it instead into the coast. Jen Francis and some others would argue that this high was made more likely because of the uh, low Arctic summer sea ice immediately before. And so that's another way that Sandy's course may have been shaped by climate change. And then there is a third way, the one that's most unambiguous and the one I'm going to relate to the rest of my talk, which is sea level rise. Storm surges. The effects, of, um, you know, the effects of the storm on the ocean level immediately take place in the context of long-term sea level change. Um, this is a record from the Battery Tide Gauge uh, in New York City in Battery Park at the south end of Manhattan. And you can see, as we look through this record, this particular excerpt from the record starts in 1920s, but the, but the Battery Tide Gauge record discontinuously extends back to the 1850s, that over this period of time, there has been a long-term sea level increase. Um, sea, level rise, sea level in New York City rose about a foot over the course of the 20th century. And so these spikes, these storms, these storm-driven storm tides, uh, are superimposed upon that foot 
of sea level change. And so if we think about Sandy, the additional foot of sea level ri uh, rise exposed more than about 100,000 additional people to flooding during the storm. So this is all sort of motivations why, you know, why I think this is one of the key challenges of our century is how we deal with this relationship between the timescales of our decisions and the timescales of their consequences, <laughs> and why in particular in New Jersey this has become of particular concern um, to uh, Rutgers as a state university. So when we're thinking about how to deal with the uh, coastal effects of climate change, I would argue that we need a sort of linked set of, no uh, of no steps of, of growing knowledge that will look something like that, this. First of all, we need an underlying understanding of what's going on. We need an underlying understanding of the physics of sea level change, of ice sheet behavior, which is closely related to sea level change, and of flood events. And Based with, on that knowledge, we can then go and start to understand, okay, what's happened in the past? What we, can we say from the historical record and the prehistorical record of geological proxies about past sea level change and flooding and how those have reshaped um, human vulnerability to sea level change or to, to flood events already? Armed with our understanding of, the, of past changes, we can build a stronger understanding of future sea level changes and how those might interact with future flood events. And then we can start thinking about those impacts on humans. So how does do the changes in um, the frequency of star high storm surges as a result of sea level change um, affect the vulnerability of our coastal regions? And armed with that knowledge, ideally we can take that and use it to build more resilient communities and think about how to protect fragile ecosystems that are stressed by many things among them, these changes that we've uh, sort of invoked in the Earth system. So over the course of the rest of this talk, um, I'm going to address five major questions. So first, that underlying understanding of the physics of sea level change and ice sheet behavior. What controls global and local sea level change? Then thinking about the past, how can we use our understanding of these physics to interpret records of past and present changes? And how can we use our understanding of the past to say something about the future? We can only say so much about the future based on the past. We have to inv invoke multiple lines of knowledge to build the best set of projections we can. So then the third question is how do we synthesize these multiple lines of knowledge to assess sea level change risks? Okay, and then, right, some of us will be maybe flooded permanently by sea level change, but most of the effects of sea level change are caused by the interaction between um, this changing sea level and storm events. So we want to know how, the, uh, see what, how sea level change um, affects the risk of flooding. And then for the last bit, I want to talk about how we might manage this. So first of all, basic physics. What, what are the factors that control global and local sea level change? So at a globally average level, there are basically only two factors that matter in terms of affecting sea level. Uh, the, those are the two factors that affect the volume of the water in the ocean. The first is thermal expansion. If you heat up water, it takes up more volume. When you pay, increase the volume of water in the ocean, the sea level rises. Um, and so well, just heating the planet causes sea level to rise. These um, set of figures are from the FIS assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're a summary of projected thermal expansion um, from a, across a variety of models for uh, four different scenarios of future carbon dioxide emissions ranging at the bottom from one that implies very strict mitigation policy, effect, essentially imposed immediately, uh, to one at the top that's consistent with continuing to burn most of the major fossil fuels resources on the planet. So this uh, second figure co corresponds to the projected model um, surface air temperature change with each of these scenarios. So you can see they range from about, and this is above um, 1981 to 2010. So you can see they range basically from about a degree of warming in 2100 under the strictest mitigation scenarios. And these are to say one degree Celsius, so almost two degrees Fahrenheit, to you know, three to five degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Celsius in 2100 <coughs> under our, what's called RCP 8.5, the closest to sort of continuing to burn all the fossil fuels on the planet scenario. The bottom plot, is showing you um, ocean thermal expansion, right? So one of the reasons when you change CO2, the temperature on the planet doesn't instantaneously respond is because the oceans are there. The oceans, like a pot of water, you have to heat up. They absorb that heat. Um, and so they will expand when you 
you know, they will expand when you put heat into the system, and they will continue slowly warming even if temperatures start to decline a little. In fact, the oceans, by acting as a store of heat, will prevent the temperature from declining very much if you were to stop CO2 emissions, at least for quite a while. And you can see the projections here. Well, you might be able to see the projections here. Uh, from this range of scenarios for 2100, you get something between about 15 and 50 centimeters of sea level rise, so um, something between like half and a foot and a half of um, sea level rise by 2100, but there's a lot that will continue into the system as a result of continuing ocean heat uptake such that over the course of a thousand years you get somewhere between, you know, uh, basically zero and four meters depending upon your, how much you're emitting of sea level rise. So that's the first factor. And that's just, you know, four meters is not uh, a small amount of sea level change. But in the grand scheme of things, uh, when we think about how sea level will evolve over longer period of times, thermal expansion becomes the secondary factor. The primary factor over longer time scales is really changes in how much water is stored on land and land ice. Um, this list is simply telling you if you were to, say, melt all the major sources of ice on the planet and put that water in the ocean and immediately and distribute that over the ocean, how much uh, change in global mean sea level you would expect. Um, so if you look at nonpolar glaciers and ice caps, so Andes, Himalayas, et cetera, you got to have something like 30 centimeters of sea level equivalent locked up in those ice sheets, so about a foot. If you look at sort of the periphery of Greenland and, and, and Antarctica, you have another half foot, so another, or another half, sorry, I keep trying, I, I, how many of you are, me, are, are metric people? OK, so I'm going to continue trying to mix my units. And I'm probably going to continue to get confused. But you get about half a meter, um, so about a foot and a half uh, for, on Greenland and Antarctica. And then you come to the three largest sources of ice on the planet, right? Greenland and the Antarctic. Greenland, if you were to melt all of it, that would cause about seven meters of sea level rise. That's about 25 feet. West Antarctica, that would cause about five meters of sea level rise. So that's about 20, 18 feet. And East Antarctica. Um, 52 meters of sea level rise, about 180 feet, right? So this is not saying any of this is going to melt anytime soon. That's the next part of the talk. This is just saying if you were to take all of that ice and put it in the ocean, what would happen? So I talked about global and local sea level change. Um, many of us have this misconception that the ocean is sort of like a bathtub. If you put heat into it or you put ice into it, you know, sea level will rise equally everywhere. There's a number of factors that cause that not to be the case. Um, just the main ones. So one of them that's of particular importance to those, to those of us in the Northeast has to do with ocean dynamic effects. So if you look at this map, this is uh, average sat, uh, sea height of the sea surface has measured by satellite altimetry from 1992 to 2002. So the red areas are areas where you have um, higher sea surface height uh, relative to Earth's gravitational potential. Um, and what you can see is you have this relatively high, and it also happens to be relatively warm water coming from the Caribbean carried towards Europe by the Gulf Stream. If you look at the scale on the right, what you can see is that the sea surface height is about two feet higher off of Bermuda than it is off of New York City or Boston. And this is maintained by the, the ocean dynamics that drive the Gulf Stream. There is a potential um, under a warmer climate for the Gulf Stream to weaken. Uh, models tend to disagree on the magnitude of the effect, but some models would say that this effect could cause as much of about 30 centimeters or a foot of sea level rise in the northeastern U.S. over the course of the 21st century due to weakening of this difference. The second major set of effects, and the one that, that's very important if you're thinking about changes in, in ice sheets, are what you might call mass redistribution effects, what we tend um, in the technical literature to call static equilibrium effects. And these all have to do with the fact that ice sheets are big masses of ice. Right? So if you have a big mass and you move it around, you will do things like reshape the Earth's gravitational field or reshape how the Earth is spinning, what direction and how fast. And you'll also bend the crust underneath it. So just to illustrate, so over here, imagine you have a planet. It has, pretend it has an ocean. If you were to extract water from that ocean and put it in an ice sheet, by building the ice sheet, you're taking water out of the ocean, so you shrink global mean sea level. But by emplacing this mass at the pole, you're changing the gravitational field. So you get a sea level rise 
near the growing ice sheet, even as you get a global mean sea level fall. If you um, combine the gravitational effect with the effects on the crust and the effects on the rotation, you get what we call a static <laughs> equilibrium fingerprint. So over on the left is the static equilibrium fingerprint associated with West Antarctic melt, on the right with Greenland melt. So the red area in each of these plots are areas that experience a sea level fall when you melt an ice sheet. So if you melt the Greenland ice sheet, you cause a sea level fall in Scotland. If you melt the Greenland ice sheet, because we're relatively close to the Greenland ice sheet, we will have a reduced sea level rise compared to the global average. So we experience about um, four-tenths of a foot of sea level rise in, the, in, say, in the New York City, so a little less here, um, from Greenland melt compared to uh, for every foot of global sea level rise. On the other hand, if you look at the West Antarctic, when you melt the West Antarctic, you have a significant impact on the orientation of Earth's um, spin axis. And the particular pattern associated with that causes this extra sea level rise on both coasts of the United States. So when we melt, if one melts the West Antarctic, you would get about 1.2 feet of sea level rise on the coast of the US for every foot of global sea level rise. Um, you'll also notice if you happen, unfortunately, to be living, say, in the middle of the Pacific, uh, no matter what melts, you're going to get an extra 20% or so sea level rise. So that's uh, sort of the immediate effects associated with mass redistribution. Uh, the next fact, uh, fact, and somebody was coming up to me asking for this name uh, before my talk, is, that, is what we call isostasy. So it's basically the long-term counterpart of the mass redistribution effect. So if you were to take a mass off of Greenland, right? So if you think about the continents, they're sort of sitting in the mantle. The mantle slow flows, but it flows very slowly. So if you remove a mass here, eventually the mantle is going to flow in underneath and replace that mass. Um, and 20,000 years ago, there was a giant ice sheet, as I mentioned, in North America. Um, it retreated by 7,000 years ago to disappearing with the last bit centered in Hudson Bay. And as a consequence of that, the mantle is flowing in under Hudson Bay. Um, the crust is rising under Hudson Bay, so the, the sea level, equivalently, the sea level is falling. Um, and out on the margins, on the edge of where the ice sheet was, that ice sheet had been sort of depressing the crust underneath it and causing a bulge on the edges. So you can think about, say, an elastic sheet or a mattress, right? When you, when you push down on it, you get this little peripheral bulge, as we call it. Well, that peripheral bulge is subsiding, and so you see in sort of the um, fringe around this, including um, where we are in Boston and sort of peaking around sort of New York and Maryland and Virginia, um, the, the collapsing peripheral bulge. So we get an extra sea level rise caused by ongoing response to the end of the last ice age. So in fact, we can see this on this map. So this is uh, analysis that we've done at Rutgers, um, looking at tide gauge records along the east coast of the US. Um, you know, I can get into the statistical details later with, with people who are interested. Um, but what you'll notice, this is basically showing how much additional sea level rise you're experiencing compared to the global average over the course of the of observational period, so the 20th and late 19th century. And you'll notice you get this sort of particularly high amount of sea level rise um, on New Jersey to Virginia, which is a combination of both this glacial isostatic adjustment and the fact that New Jersey and Virginia and all points south are what we call the coastal plain. So they're a pile of sand, and this pile of sand under its own weight, and as a result of the withdrawal of groundwater from it for drinking purposes, sort of collapses, compacts. So if we look at Boston um, and look at how much 20 sea level rise there was in the 20th century, well, globally, it was about 1.7 millimeters per year, about 7 inches of century. In Boston, because of this ongoing response to the last ice age, it was about 10 inches per century. In New York City, again, because of the ongoing response, it's about a foot a century. And in Atlantic City, because of the combination of this glacial isostatic adjustment and this compaction, you get about 15 inches. And Norfolk, again, because of that combination, you get about 17 inches over the course of the century. So expanding a little on what's already come before us, um, so I already mentioned right the ba uh, battery tide gauge. So this is a little larger picture that was um, from an article um, in the Times uh, that Justin Gillis did last month, which was, was a pretty nice article. 
Um, and this is basically something where you have um, part of the tide gauge is fixed to land, and the other part of it is free to float in the ocean. And so sea level is defined as a difference between the thing that's fixed to land and the thing that's floating in the ocean. And so as I said, um, the, battery, the battery tide gauge is one of the oldest in the country. San Francisco is the only one with the longest one. And the, both of those sort of started in the 1850s um, and haven't quite operated continuously. But they provide some of the, um, they are among the dozen longest uh, records in the world. And so for that period of time, which is basically the middle of the 19th century, um, pushing to sort of the beginning of the 19th century in parts of northern Europe, we have direct observations of sea level change. And so that gives us direct observations both of storm tides and of this longer term trend. But if we want to get a longer context, we have to rely on geological sources of information. Um, this is a picture by my colleague Ben Horton at, at the Rutgers Institute for Marine and Coastal Sciences. Um, this is his collaborator Chris Vane and a bunch of high school students they took out with the field, into the field with them in the salt marshes of New Jersey to collect sediments. So this is a, this is a sediment core here. And you know, what, they, what they're looking for in the sediment core are basically um, the fossils of organisms called foraminifera. And different species of foraminifera have different parts of the tidal range um, they like prefer to live in. So by looking at the particular assemblages, they can reconstruct past sea level with about a 10 centimeter, about a 4 inch resolution. So they did this. Um, in New Jersey. Um, and so here in red is the battery tide gauge data. And the boxes are reflecting their geological <laughs> reconstruction. And it aligns relatively well. And what they found is that in New Jersey, since basically the American Revolution, sea level has risen by about um, half or half a meter or so. So roughly one and a half feet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, and you can see you know, sort of where on, um, on this time, you know, different major storms in the course of the city's history have taken place. So when you look at, going back to where we start, when you look at storm tides, um, and I just say storm tide terminology, terminologically, so that's a combination of the storm surge, which is driven by the, 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 the meteorology, by the wind, and the tide, tidal range, which can be about five feet at New York City. Um, if you look at storm tides, what you see is that this has been a non small but non-negligible uh, contributor to, the, um, to changes in storm tides over the course of the co our country's history. Right? So this red and blue area is basically the increment of sea level rise. And then this, um, the white area is the tidal contribution to the height of different storms. And the gray area is the storm surge contribution. So you can see Sandy, right, 4 meters, 14 feet. Um, uh, 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 storm surge. Um, you know, the 1821 storm has about 3.2 meters. Um, and actually, it was probably at a high, you know, the storm surge component was actually larger than Sandy. It just happened not to come at high tide and happened not to come with that extra foot and a half of sea level rise. Just out of curiosity, yeah. how does this compare to things like Katrina or other parts of the world? Uh, do you find that same um, differential? Uh, well, well I'll, sh I'll show you in a, in, in a second. But uh, so um, you know, we have in the in uh, well, let's say in New, in New York City, we have the advantage of the tide gauge record, which is uh, you don't necessarily have everywhere. Um, it's actually quite a bit of work to create high quality decimeter scale um, paleo sea level records. So we you, there, the records for for the Gulf, the, the um, Mississippi Delta aren't quite as good. Over the course of the 20th century, um, the rate of Additional sea level rise due to compaction in New Orleans has been about um, seven millimeters a year, so 70 centimeters over the course of a century, just due to compaction and and the fact that we've sort of cut off the supply of sediment to it. So that's an extra about uh, about two feet a century, just from the, just from those non-climatic effects that are human caused. Yeah. You call that sea level rise instead of land depression. Um, so sea level is defined as the difference between. Okay, so the, 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 the surface and, and land. Um, the more, slightly more technical, actually, the, the glacial isostatic adjustment, which is part of, driving part of this, the part that's not climatic, a lot of people just call that land sinking. It's actually not just the land sinking. It, you're also moving 
mass around in the mantle, so you're also changing the, the shape of the gra Earth's gravitational field, and so it's actually a combination of those effects. Yeah? The 93 storm event was on the prior slide as a major peak uh, on, the, on the line, the earlier slide that you had. No, so, so, the, so this slide? Uh, no, I'm sorry, the, the earlier one showing the, uh, uh, the peak periods at the battery gauge. Uh, th this, the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the 93 event is there, but not on this well, other chart. The, is uh, there? This is December 1990. This is a 20th 1993, century. yes. Yeah. Yeah. I is there some reason it's not listed here? Uh, Was it? Different papers. Oh, honestly. okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So this is, this is sort of the last 300 years, but we can take the, um, we can we can take the, that approach that, that Ben has been using and, and Andy Kemp, his, his former student who's now at Tufts, has been using um, and apply it further back in time. And so that's um, some work we've been doing um, that we published uh, last year. So this is, the, the blue dots are basically more of these sediment core data going back now 7,000 BCE. Um, and you can see sort of the, the, the shape of the sea level curve. So first of all, right, you see, as we're still 7,000 7, years ago, you know, there was still that little bit of ice left in, in, in North America over the Hudson Bay. So that's still melting. So you have a relatively fast sea level rise. And then it slows down as the ice stops melting into the ocean. And basically, the main factor driving sea level change over this period is simply the ongoing adjustment to that prior ice melt. Um, so what we can say, based on this analysis, is that if you go back about 4,000 years, so we go back to about 2300 BC, so that's around the time of the construction of the pyramids, um, the 20th century rate of sea level rise, we can say with about 95% confidence, was faster than it during any other century in that, in that period. Right, so something changed in the 20th century. And you know, it won't surprise you that mo the most likely candidate for that change is the fact that we've been pumping this additional CO2 in the atmosphere and causing a consequent change in global mean temperature. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take one more step back um, because if, as we're looking over that, this past period, right, this is not the, the, the temperature around 6,000 um, years ago was, was sort of the, the, the peak of temperature prior to the, the 18th century or 19th century. Um, but it wasn't very much warmer than, than the pre-industrial. If we want to look at analogs in the past that have been significantly warmer than today, we have to go back further. Um, and so we take advantage of the fact that over the last two million years, the Earth has basically oscillated between long, cold glacial periods, which we call ice stages, and short, warmer periods, which we call interglacial periods. Um, so this is a uh, plot from paleoclimatologists. So for those of you who aren't, time runs backward on this plot. So time goes from right to left. Um, People don't realize that time before present is a negative number. Um, but what you see, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on, on what these particular proxies reflect, but you can see, say, on this one, these, these higher values reflect the periods when there is more ice on the planet. Right, so this is oxygen isotopes. Uh, and those, these lower values reflect the period where there is less ice on the planet. And as you can see, these are these long, colder periods and these short, warmer periods with less ice. And you can see that also in proxy reconstructions, they have temperature from Antarctica. Now, now warmer is this way, so right, so this warm period here, the last 10,000 years, the Holocene, um, warm period here, we call the last interglacial, and then previous warm periods. So if we look for a second at the last interglacial stage, so this period here, centered around 125,000 years ago, what we can find by looking at the, the atmospheric record has recorded by the bubbles of air trapped in ice cores is that carbon dioxide concentrations, again time flowing this way, plotted down here, were during the last interglacial around 280 parts per million. So the same as they were um, in, the, in the 18th century. But the climate was different. And the climate was different because the reasons why we see this regular pacing of uh, the ice ages and the interglacials have to do with changes in the shape of Earth's orbit. And during the last interglacial, Earth's orbit was more eccentric, was more elliptical than today. And as a consequence, during the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, there was more radiation from the sun reaching the Northern Hemisphere, which had sort of feedback effects that led to a somewhat different climate than today. In particular, 
if we look at a variety of proxy records, which are pictured here from this paper uh, came out of compilation that came out about three years ago, what we find is that during the last interglacial, global mean temperature was something like two degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures. Now, if any of you are following international climate policy, you will know that two degrees C is sort of the official goal of the UN Framework Convention agreed to in the Cancun um, uh, agreements. Um, and what you, we also note, if we just look at the um, marine part of the record, that this seems to be a warming that's a little bit concentrated on land. The sea surface temperature was about 0.7 plus or minus 0.6 degrees C above pre-industrial, um, so not quite as strong as you see on land. Now, the northern hemisphere warming, we know how to explain. That's due to more intense summer insulation related to that change in the orbit. And when you have that more intense summer insulation, you can melt back ice sheets further, so you get this, this sort of in, in the sea ice further, and you get these feedbacks that lead to about three to five degrees C warming in the Arctic, which is again what consistent with what you um, expect to see with about two degrees C of global mean warming in the future. Southern hemisphere warming is actually harder to produce in climate models, um, and it's probably due to one of two things, either ocean teleconnection, so that basically means some mechanism that's not being captured in the model but is carrying heat from the warmer northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, or it's related to the fact that this change in Earth's orbit causes the melt season in the southern hemisphere to be longer. Regardless, um, what we find in the Lathless Glacial is slightly warmer than today, but not as warm as the official sort of international target. Um, and so we can ask the question, well, how high was sea level during the last interglacial? Although we do have to keep in mind that because the orbit was different, you know, not all that sea level change is necessarily due to the temperature change. Some of it may be directly caused by the changes in the orbit. So how do we do that? We can't just use sort of the sediment cores like has been done in New Jersey. You need to use cruder records, um, such as fossil coral reefs. So this is from uh, San Salvador in the Bahamas. This is not my photo, but it's actually where I went on my first geology field trip of any length as an undergrad uh, back in, I don't know, 2000. Um, this is um, Coburn Town Reef. Now these are a type of species of coral known as Acropora palmata, and these species have very particular ranges of depths they like to live in. They basically live within about 15 feet or about five meters of the sea surface. And so here, when you find them about two meters above current sea level, that tells you that sea level must have been higher than today. So this is one of the sorts of proxies you can use to inform yourself about sea level um, further back in time. So as you went down there, uh, sea level so, so, down so, in Bahamas and rising. Well, so, so we've got, we're switching time scales. So let's, let's be clear, right? So, so if we look at, um, let's look at Antarctic temperature, right? So just think of this as probably twice global mean temperature, right? So, so far we've been looking at the Holocene, the last 12,000 years, this period. So now we're going back and we're looking at the last interglacial, right? So there was an ice age in between. So there's, you know, in between sea level fell everywhere, probably around 120, 130 meters, so about 400 feet, because we build up these giant ice sheets like in North America. So now we're asking, before that period, before the last ice age, when it was last warm again, but in, in fact was slightly warmer than today, how high was sea level? Um, and I'm going the wrong way. So we can also use other proxies. Um, this, these are raised beaches from southern England. So you can see how, how the, they've been cut out. right? So they were cut out by, by tidal action. And so that would indicate that in this case, you know, the tide in southern England during this period, around 125,000 years ago, reached about the elevation of these beaches, which is about 10 feet. So we can combine all of this sorts of data using a combination of physical models and statistical models and get this result um, that we published a few years ago. This is a reconstruction of sea level during the last interglacial. And I can talk about this at length. But I just condense it to say that it's extremely likely that during this period, which, and by extremely likely we mean a 95% probability, that sea level during the last interglacial, which was you know, consistent, about as warm as international targets would have us, would have us um, peaked at least 21 feet higher than today, or about six and a half meters. And it's unlikely, only a one in three chance to have been higher than about 29 feet. Right? So that's, you know, you, one could take that has a guidepost and not has a literal statement, but as a guidepost that maybe the long-term sea level rise commitment associated with a two degree sea warming would be in this range. Um, 
we can also ask, well, during this period, how about how fast was sea level changing within the last interglacial? Gives you, again, a sense with climate forcing, not that much stronger than today, what sort of rates you might expect. And you find sort of thousand year average rates in the range of three to seven meters per thousand years in terms of global mean sea level change. So that's about a foot or two feet in century. So that's just, again, a guidepost. We might want to ask, well, OK, so the last interglacial carbon dioxide concentrations weren't much more different, weren't much different than they were about 250 years ago. What if we had to go back to some time when CO2 concentrations were like what they were today? Well, to do that, uh, well, if you go back before 800,000 years ago, you no longer have bubbles of air trapped in ice cores to tell you what CO2 concentrations were. So you have much cruder and less accurate proxies. Um, but what we can find is that probably the last time sea level were con sorry, CO2 concentrations were comparable to today um, they, the, um, would, was probably around 3 million years ago during a period we call the Pliocene. Um, and what we find is that sea level, if we go and look at places like this, this is the Orangenberg Scarp in James River in Virginia. And if you take that and you correct it for the motion of the land, um, and this is an area that my collaborator over at Harvard, Jerry Mitrovica, has done a fair bit of work on. What you find is that sea level was probably 50 to 80 feet higher than today with this CO2 concentrations in the range of sort of 380, 400 parts per million. So again, right, not saying that this is, you know, it doesn't say anything about how fast you transition to it. It's just a guidepost to suggest what could happen under warmer climates. And so what would that look like? So let's suppose we, we ended up with last interglacial sea levels, around 25 feet. These are maps from the New York Times from an article um, that my colleague Ben Strauss and I published about a month after Sandy. Right? And so these are showing New Jersey, New York City, and Boston with 25 feet of sea level rise. And so if 25 feet of sea level rise, you get rid of Atlantic City, you get rid of Kennedy Airport and the Rockaways, and in Boston, you get rid of most of Cambridge and about, about a third of, of the city. Right? So again, Right? This do, is not saying this is going to happen overnight, but the idea is that this, you know, the, these paleo records give you guideposts. Right? The, this tells you what the legacy we might lead our, descend, our descendants century hence would look but like. could it? The chance of it happening rapidly overnight. Let's talk about that. <laughs> um, so the paleo record tells us um, something about, about what might happen. And ideally, physical models would complete the story and tell, you know, we'd be able to model all the physics that go on in ice sheets and project something about sea level change. Unfortunately, well, a lot of people are doing great work on ice sheet modeling. It's still very difficult to capture the dynamics of ice sheets correctly. And the fundamental reason behind a lot of that is that the large scale behavior ice sheets depends a lot on relatively small scale physics. So have any of you guys seen this figure before? So Larson, the Larson B ice shelf, right? So this was, um, you know, 2002, January, Right, so this was a floating mass of ice um, sitting in the Antarctic, floating sea ice. So when it melts, it doesn't change sea level. It's already in the sea. But it has a buttressing effect on the ice sheet that can flow from the, continents into, from the continent into the ocean. But at this ocean ice shelf interface, a lot of detailed physics matters significantly. Right, so for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm going to march through February 2002. This, by the way, is a 40 kilometer uh, 30-ish miles, 25-mile scale bar. Um, and you can see, in the course of about a month, you know, this entire ice shelf that had been slowing the flow of the Antarctic ice sheet into the ocean turned into open water, and its buttressing effect went away. To be able to model accurately you know, what's going to happen to ice sheets in the future using physical models, you have to um, be able to model these sorts of, of behaviors, at the, the things like these ocean ice shelf interactions. And people are working on it, but it's hard. So you might want complementary approaches. So one complementary approach people have been looking at is what's called semi-empirical models. So these are basically models that look at past relationships between temperature and global mean sea level, GSL, uh, and use that, assume that past relationship um, between temperature and rate of sea level change continues into the future. So using this model, um, some of my collaborators at Potsdam published a couple of years ago projections that under basically no additional policy, you would expect to see sea level rise of 70 to 140 centimeters, or about 28 to 55 inches globally averaged by 2100. And that with aggressive mitigation, you know, something consistent with this two degree target, you would expect to see more like 50 to 100 centimeters, or 20 to 39 inches. 
but there's a lot of limitations of these empirical models that lead many people to be skeptical of them. And there's also a limit in terms of their application. First of all, they look at the relationship between global mean temperature and global mean sea level, which is all well and good, but nobody lives at the global mean, right? They were interested in local sea level. And if you don't have the process detail, if you don't know what of this is caused by changes in thermal expansion and what is caused by changes in ice sheets, you can't translate this very readily into, say, what's happening here at Boston. Second, there's a calibration issue. Either you've taken the temperature record and calibrated it against the observational tide gauge record, which is about 200 years, which is pretty short. Or you've taken it in the case of this one and calibrated it against a single paleo record. Uh, so they used a record, um, Andy Kemp and Ben Horton, uh, generated from North Carolina, which goes back 1,500 years. But that's just the record of sea level at one particular site. So it you know, could have local effects in there. And in the case of North Carolina record, I think we can make a strong case that it has significant effects associated with changes in the Gulf Stream. Um, in addition, regardless of whether you're looking at global or regional reconstruction, you're looking at a period where thermal expansion and regionally ocean dynamics dominated sea level change. And you're using that to project forward to a change, a period in which land ice changes may dominate sea level change. So the, le the applicability because of that change of process may be limited. We're working, um, including collaborating with, with Stefan Romsdorf and others who, who are in this area, on trying to improve the semi-empirical approach. But at some level, it's fundamentally limited um, because of that, of, of, of that change in, in processes that might be important over time. So we'd since we can't rely on physical models, and since, uh, since the semi-empirical approach has these limitations, we really need to synthesize multiple lines of knowledge uh, to come up with the best projections we can of future sea level change. Um, so that's what we've done in a paper that's in review. Um, and I'm just going to show you a bunch of slides from this in review paper with the caveat that these numbers may change as, as peer review dictates. Um, and so the idea with this with, with framework is, well, we have these different con processes that contribute to sea level rise, right? So we have ice sheet melt. We have glacier and ice cap melt. We have ocean dynamics and thermal expansion, which we lump together as oceanographic processes. We have some sort of non-climatic background due to things like compaction and glacial isostatic adjustment. We also have a small contribution from something I haven't mentioned before, because over the 20th century, it probably nets out to zero, which is land water storage. Um, you know, changes. If you build more dams, you reduce sea level. If you extract groundwater and pump it into the ocean, you increase sea level. All right, so these are, these are all the five factors you know, that could be significant. Yeah? Right. Let me, go th let me go through those. So for each of these processes, we rely on a variety of sources of knowledge. So IPCC fifth assessment report, right? So that's, you know, think of that as sort of the community expert assessment of knowledge. So it's a sort of integration of the literature. And so we rely on IPCC's numbers directly for land water storage, and we rely on them as one input to, uh, into the ice sheet melt estimates. Um, I'll, I'll dig into that in a, in a moment. But the, you asked about the expert elicitation. Well, that's basically you go and you ask a bunch of experts, and you have them say, well, what is your best estimate? And then I, you ask them some questions that they should know the answer to. And you use the answers to the questions they should know the answer to, to to calibrate how much trust you put in their projections. So it's essentially a formal social scientific method for assessing expert knowledge. Um, so. So were those experts the ones in IPCC? Or uh, well, the, pre probably the, the people involved in IPCC are almost a su certainly a super subset of any subset of climate scientists you want. Uh, the IPCC engages about 2,000 scientists. It, it, it's sort of a, 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 a burden that the community bears because the international process and, and some domestic climate policies think it's important. But it is sort of something that engages a whole lot of the community. Um, so that's where ice sheet melt is. And I'll, talk about that briefly again in a second. Um, for gl glaciers and ice cap melts and oceanographic processes, we rely on what I'm calling the CMIT-5 global climate model. So this is basically the state-of-the-art large global climate models. Um, you add on to that a layer that translates sort of temperature and precipitation and evaporation changes into glacier and ice cap behavior um, here. And we can use these global climate models directly for the ocean graphics processes. And so they, the, what the, ice, the IPCC predicts for things like changes in ice sheet melts are informed 
has part of this assessment by what the global climate models project. And then we have these non-climatic processes, which ultimately come from our statistical analysis of tide gauge data. Now, for ice sheets and glaciers, as, as I said, there are these factors, what we call the static equilibrium factors, having to do with mass redistribution that change the sea level expression of that. So we have to integrate those in as well. So that uh, component comes from Jerry Metrovica across the river. And so we take all of these together, and we generate projections of local sea level. And we try carefully to assess the uncertainties in each of these terms so that we can come up with a risk distribution, probability distribution, for these projections. How, how am I doing on time? Good? OK. So then I'll just address the, I'll, I'll address the, um, the, the land ice changes uh, briefly and just to say, right, so we have these two sources, the, the um, IPCC and this expert elicitation. And the key thing about the IPCC is that they very explicitly were unwilling to say anything other than what they call a likely range. So 17th percentile to 83rd percentile. Now, if you're doing a risk assessment, you might want to know about that upper 17%, which the Bamber and Aspinall expert elicitation probed into a little more. Uh, so they probed up to the 1 in 20 or the 95%, 95th percentile. Um, so we try to, in our, in our approach, to sort of synthesize results, accepting the assessment of the community about the likely range of sea level, but using the expert elicitation to tell us, well, what about those tails beyond the likely range? Um, so that's, that's one comment I wanted to say on that. So what do we get? Well, the first result from this analysis is that based on the plausible combinations of processes, different sites have different sensitivities to what I'm calling climatically driven sea level change. So this is a component that's related to the climate, and it basically has to do with thermal expansion, ocean dynamics, and land ice changes. So up here on the plot here, um, the colors reflect the ratio of these sort of climatically driven sea level changes to at a local level to, a glo to those at a global level um, in the median, at the 50th percentile. And so numbers greater than one means that at the median, that site is going to experience more than global sea level rise as a result of climate change, while less than one means it experiences less than global sea level rise as a result of climate change. So the basic pattern you see is that in the median, the Central Pacific, for the reasons I already talked about having to do with the, the sort of mass redistribution effect, experiences about 10 or percent or more sea level rise than the global average. And then generally, as you go to higher latitudes, as you get nearer the ice sheets, uh, you experience less sea level rise as a result of climate change, because you're getting in these fields where the land ice changes are causing a sea level fall. Um, a slight but important break from this pattern you can see in the northeastern US. That's a result of these ch potential changes in, in ocean circulation that uh, come as a result of climate change. And then on the bottom, we're looking at basically the spread in this ratio. Depending on what processes are contributing, how much of a variability can you get in this ratio? And you can see basically um, in the high latitudes where it matters a lot what particular combination of ice melts, you get a fair bit of variability. And in areas like the northeastern US and the Baltic Sea where ocean dynamics matter a lot, you also get a fair bit of variability. Here at Boston, uh, the median ratio is about 1.04, so in the median, Boston would get about 4% more climatically driven sea level rise than the global average, with a 67% range from about 0.74 to 1.31. But this is only the climatically driven component. right? This takes place in a context where things like the ongoing response to the end of the last ice age are still important. So we can also look at these background rates. Um, I'll just focus, sorry focus here on North America, and what you can see is that you have sort of two hot spots of background sea level rise. So the biggest hot spot is down in the Mississippi Delta, you know, as we already mentioned, for reasons having to do both with, with sediment compaction in the Delta, <coughs> groundwater withdrawal in the Delta, and starving the sediment supply in the Delta because of the way we've constricted the rivers. So you can get in New, New Orleans up to seven to eight millimeters per year of sea level rise. You know, that's almost two, uh, two, uh, one centimeter. So 0.2, 0.3 inches a year, a lot. And then here in the Mid-Atlantic region, um, at around Norfolk, uh, you're getting around three millimeters per year. So about half, you know, and the highest in the Mid-Atlantic, you get about, two, about one third of that at, at New Orleans. 
And then if you look on the west coast, you see things, and some areas look kind of complicated because there's a lot of tectonics going on there. Um, if we look here at Boston, right, so we add to these, this factor of 1.04 with an error, uh, an addition of about 0.8 plus or minus 0.3 millimeters per year of sea level rise, where one millimeter per year corresponds to four inches per century. Right, so because of the land motion at Boston, you get something like three and a half extra inches per century. So if we take all this and combine it together, we can get our projections for uh, 2050, 2100, and although I'm not showing them, 2200. Um, so this is showing you the global mean projections. This is in, in meters. The, the different lines are showing you different confidence intervals, and the different colors correspond to different um, projected future emissions. So the key things, I'm just going to let you, um, you know, look at the whole table. But globally, our likely range, so that's our 67% probability range, would be something like 9 to, 15 to not, uh, sorry, 9 to 14 inches by 2050, and 2 feet to a little over uh, 3 feet by 2100. Under this scenario, RCP 8.5, that corresponds to continued fossil fuel intensive emissions growth, if you approximate it. I mean, there's people here who do scenario analysis, and we can get into why that's not exactly that. But, uh, Get likely in that range, we have a 1 in 20 chance globally of about more than 15 inches by 20, between 2000 and 2050, uh, and 1 in 20 cents of about 4 feet by 2000 and uh, uh, 2100. Now here in Boston, you know, we're not, you're not quite as exposed to New York City, definitely not quite as exposed as Norfolk, but if we look at, say, by 2100, we get projections of about 2 to 4 feet um, likely range by 2100, a 1 in 20 chance of about 5 feet, and a uh, 1 in 200 chance um, of about, uh, of, of almost 7 feet. So then we can, next point, you know, there's this difference between these emission scenarios. You can do something through mitigation, right? This is not all baked into the system already. Um, if you were to go from this like fossil fuel intensive growth trajectory to this one that requires, in fact, negative carbon dioxide emissions by the last quarter of the century, you can shave about a foot to a foot and a half off of your projected ranges. So that would choose, turn the light, this, this low emission scenario would turn the likely range in Boston from 24 to 48 inches to 13 to 31 inches, and would turn the 1 in 200 number from 82 inches to 64 inches. Is this assuming that the ice the poles wouldn't all melt at once? Uh, well, so some of this distribution is that the high end is, is, is consistent with, you know, what, what climate, you know, some of the ice sheet models would tell you what happens if you really push the ice sheets. So, you know. But this is not Greenland falling into the ocean. No, it's not, it's not Greenland falling into the ocean. It's, it's consistent with, with expert, expect you know, expert judgments of that tail risk, right? right? So. And this is um, also in, um, with the assumption, I mean, they talked about the summer ice in the Arctic being gone by 2015. Yeah, that, so that doesn't affect sea level rise directly. That only affects sea level rise in as much as it changes climate weather patterns that might affect, right, because it's ice floating in the ocean. Um, and so, yeah, and so to the extent it affects weather patterns, that's in the climate models. And so that will be in the forcing that goes into some of the ice sheets. Now we can look and say, okay, what, is the, what are the sources of uncertainty in these projections? Um, so these upper two parts are looking at sources of uncertainty in global sea level. The bottom two are looking at sources of uncertainty in New York City sea level. And this big red wedge here, this is a fraction of uncertainty that's due to uncertainty about what the Antarctic ice sheet is going to do. This second wedge is basically uncertainty in what Greenland's going to do. And this third wedge is uncertainty in thermal expansion. So you can see by the end of the century, uncertainty in Antarctica in particular and the ice sheets in general comes to dominate the uncertainty about what's going to happen. But that's not true everywhere. Right? If you look at New York, this is the uncertainty due to Antarctica. Very little is due to Greenland because you're not as exposed to Greenland melt. And then there's this big wedge here that's the uncertainty due to what ocean dynamics are going to do. So in most case places, it's Antarctica that dominates our uncertainty. And if we understood Antarctica better, we would get better projections. But in some places, as in New York, the uncertainty in, in ocean, what's, how the oceans are going to change is also very important. So we've quantified to our best ability, let's say, a first cut at the, at the risk of sea level change over the century. 
but we don't really care for most areas about sea level per se. We care about how that interacts with storm surge. Right? So if you look at historical storms um, in New York City, so this is a little bit of a complicated part, but this is feet above mean lowest low water or meters above mean lowest low water. So that's like the lowest tide in the, in, during the month. Um, and these are numbers that correspond to the dates of different historical peak storm surges. Um, so uh, at the battery, Superstorm Sandy, uh, Oct uh, October 29th, 2012, had a storm surge that peaked about 14 feet above mean lowest low water. Uh, the next highest was Hurricane Donna in 1960, about 10 feet. The estimated one in 100 year storm is about nine and three quarters feet. And the estimated one in 10 year storm is about eight and a half feet. If you just increment that by a bit, let's say we add 16 inches of sea level rise, which is sort of the median projection for 2050, you can ask, well, how does that change? Assuming you know, that, that things like the changes in the topography when you do that, or changes in the frequency of intense storms do doesn't change. Well, what you find is that just 16 inches of sea level rise is enough to turn the one in 10 year storm into New York City to the, what, the current one in 100 year storm. And if you're at the high end of the prediction, say 66 inches of sea level rise, which is sort of a 3% probability by our risk assessment, it's enough to turn the one in 10 year storm into a superstorm standy level flooding. Yeah? Do they know how that will affect the life of the ocean, the fish, and so forth? Well, sea level rise itself prob probably doesn't have much effect on, on life in the ocean. But there are a lot of things that do, including the changes in temperature that are, that are driving some of this, yes. and the changes in the acidity of the ocean that are related to putting more CO2. Yeah, and changes in salinity that are also related to this. So if we just look at this, right? so this is, this is nine feet of sea level rise above mean highest high water um, switch sources to switch datum. Um, this is from a really nice website by my collaborators at Climate Central. If you don't know it, sealevel.climatecentral.org. So you can go and look at your community and, and, and look at sea level and how many people are exposed and whatnot. But if we look at what's in New York City exposed to nine foot sea level rise plus storm surge, which is Superstorm Sandy today or a one in 10 year storm with five feet of sea level rise, see that that's about almost $200 billion of property and almost a million people that are at risk. Also, 65 fire and EMS stations, about 30 hospitals. You know, there's a lot, lot exposed there. If we look at Boston, um, you know, the current 100-year flood elevation is about five and a half feet above mean highest high water. That corresponds to around 40,000 people in Boston and Cambridge. But they're planning to put so many more people on the harbor. So yeah. There's... Yes, right. You have to take into account changing the land use patterns. Now that one in a hundred year flood zone, if we look at our projections, that's very likely to be between about a one in nine and one in 27 year storm by 2050 and between about an annual and one in 15 year flood by 2080. Right? So that's you know, something to be thinking about as you figure out where to build. In fact, I would argue that thinking about things in these terms of where the one in a 100 year flood zone is, is fundamentally an obsolete way of thinking about things. What you really want to be thinking about is suppose you have a project or suppose you have an area you're interested in. You want to know how likely it is to flood and how many times it's likely to flood over the lifetime of that project. Right? So we can combine our sea level rise projections with flood risk projections. Um, and we can say, well, given certain time windows and given certain emission scenarios, well, how many times do you expect something to flood at different levels? So we can say, let's look at what we call the one in 10 year flood zone or one in 100 year flood zone. How many floods, given sea level rise, do you actually expect to see in that zone, say, between 2000 and 2030, or 2050, or 2100? So this figure, you know, where you're looking at flood height here in, in meters, um, the y-axis is sort of the expected number, sorry, expected number of events per year averaged over different time windows. And what you find is, let's say, between 2000 and 2030, in the one in 10 year flood zone, you see not three expected events, but seven. Right? So that's about a doubling of the risk. You see not about 0.3 expected one in 100 year events, but 0.6. Between 2000 and 2050, you see about 19 to 20 one in 10 year events, depending on expect expected events. Right? So this is a, an average of a whole lot of different possible futures, um, which is about a quadrupling of risk, and likewise about two one in 100 year events, which is also a quadrupling of risk. 
And over the course of the century, you see 60 to 70 expected 1 to 10 year events. So uh, 6 to 7 fold increase in risk. And 20 to 30, 1 in 100 year events. So that's a 20 to 30 fold increase in risk. Right? And that's you know, because at some point, you, know, you just get to the point where you know, it could be the annual flood. So what I would say is what matters is not really just next year's flood risk. That's, you know, if you're doing the flood insurance program and you're not thinking about how it's, your flood insurance program will say land use, you're only thinking about uh, insuring for next year, maybe, maybe you only care about next year's flood risk. But if you think about long-term use pattern, it's the integrated flood risk over the lifetime of a project that matters, and also what the consequences of that flooding are. So just uh, as it has, uh, I don't know if any of you guys work on infrastructure. Um, but, but one caution I like, like is that you know, maybe thinking of, say, a 40 to 80 year lifetime of a power plant or a bridge or whatever. But in fact, the decisions we make when we think about where to put infrastructure can last a really long time. And just one illustration, so thinking about, say, the electric grid in New Jersey. This um, map, which unfortunately you can't see very well, comes from the Electric Railway Journal, 1911. It's a map of the Public Service Electric Company, which now PSE&G service area. And the dots on it correspond to different generation stations and, and different um, uh, switching stations. So one of these dots, which I've marked with a star here, was the location of the Marion Power Plant. Um, state in Jersey City, which was built by P the Public Service Electric Company in 1905 and retired as a generating station in 1961. There's another, this is its picture from the 1911 journal. There's another power plant on the same, uh, almost the same site, the Hudson Generating Station, which has been operating uh, since this retired. And there's still a switching station on this original site. The says switching station, right, which, remember you can, which was sited in 1905, flooded in 2011 during Irene and in 2012 during Sandy. So the siting, even though the infrastructure itself had retired, the siting decision had this more than century long time scale. In fact, if you look at this map and you look at the list of major switching stations that flooded during Sandy, these red ones are all the ones, all the ones in the list of the 14 substations, which are more than half, that you can find the location of on this 1911 map of the New Jersey grid. Right? So those siting decisions had a profound impact on the vulnerability of New Jersey to, to, to flooding over a century later. And these were sea level flooding, siting decisions that probably didn't take into account what could have been known about flood risk then, and certainly didn't take into account what, could, what, um, what, what uh, is known now about sea level change. So you know, the, again, key point here, you, know, you can lock, your decisions can lock in um, you know, some of these siting decisions. And most likely, once you've made those decisions, they're not going to change again unless you're in a crisis. And as we can see in New Jersey, maybe not even after a crisis are you going to change some of these decisions. So that's some cautions about these numbers I've given you. You know, different approaches to generating these risk probabilities will give somewhat different answers. And ultimately, um, you know, we ultimately need better physical process models, but we aren't there yet. Uh, you know, we're using flood recurrence probabilities that are based on historical data. In the case of Boston, for the Boston tide gauges, they're not necessarily a true sample of the actual risk. Um, and that tide gauge is not necessarily representative of the whole region. Um, and you'd ultimately want more, more detailed process modeling of the flooding as well. Nonetheless, it's clear that sea level rise will dramatically reshape flood risk over the course of this century. So in the last couple of minutes, what do we do? Well, we have lots of options, and you know, again, you know, these things only get considered often in the aftermath of a crisis. Well, in New Jersey, we're going through a rebuilding process, so these are active decisions. So one option is we can rebuild unchanged. Uh, many people in New Jersey, I think, would like this, and then we, that implies we assume the rest of the country will continue to subsidize us indefinitely. You can build, invest in hard, protective infra infrastructure. Um, this is the mass lung caring. Um, I, if my Dutch pronunciation is any good, in the Netherlands, um, right? So this is a floodgate. You can see the tide coming in and being stopped there. So we could invest in hard infrastructure like that. That makes sense probably for somewhere like Manhattan, where you have relatively narrow entryways and a whole lot of capital exposed. It's probably very difficult somewhere like the Jersey Shore, where you have a very long area with a lot of diffuse investments. You can raise and otherwise modify our communities uh, to be resilient to occasional flooding. And so you're seeing a lot of this going on on the shore now where you raise the houses. 
You may not be raising them enough, though, if you just go by, by FEMA guidance and what the National Flood Insurance Plan goes by, because those don't incorporate sea level rise in them at the moment. Or as in Staten Island and par parts of Staten Island and Long Island, we can say, well, we shouldn't really be building in these places at all. We should buy people out and get them to raise the communities and, and retreat. So I'm not going to offer answers to these. I just say, well, these are things we need, decisions we need to make. Um, and we can make them technocratically, for instance, through land use policy that's informed by benefit cost analysis, taking into account explicitly some of these Fred lists. We can take them into account economically. You know, if we can estimate flood risk, we can price it with things such as accurate long-term flood insurance. Right? And you can't really get long-term flood insurance right now. You buy it on an annual contract. That doesn't provide any market signal about these longer-term effects. But if you, say, had to buy flood insurance with the lifetime of your mortgage, you would start to begin seeing some of these signals about evolving flood risk in the market. Or as some of my colleagues in the Blaustein School of Planning at, at Rutgers are working on, you can try to bring all this in democratically through deliberative community processes. And I would say, yes, we need to do all of these. And all of them need to be informed by risk assessments that reflect our best available knowledge. The one thing we can't do is wish or legislate, as some states have attempted, sea level rise away. So thanks. Yeah. I saw an article recently in the paper that said that flood insurance was, for some people was costing something like fifty dollars or $60,000 a year. Almost as much as buying the house used to be. Yeah, so, now, so, I guess so, that would be an example of, of driving people away from that from that area. Yeah, so that so so there was Congress a couple of years ago passed a flood insurance reform that tried to um, basically re redo uh, the pricing of the national flood insurance program in a way that would make the the program uh, fiscally sound. So actually assessing the risks involved, and what that reveals is that we have through some of these this citing decisions that I talked about. You know, we've built up in areas that. You know, if you had had properly priced market signals to start with, probably never would have been built up in. So now you have you, know, you have this this challenge, right? If um, you know if they're paying sixty thousand dollars on the flood insurance program, they're probably unlike many on the Jersey Shore, relatively wealthy. But you know, and there's a lot of people on the shore who are not you know your image of you know relatively well-to-do shore communities. There's there's a lot of working class people on the shore. And shocking them with these sort of rates is, is something hard, and it just you know points to the need for you know this to be a part of a dem deliberative democratic process to think about how to deal with this. There's um, there's actually a really good report on the oh sorry, there's a really good report on uh, the flood insurance program from several years ago actually from the Heinz Center, mm -hmm. and the national flood insurance program maybe up until the reforms. Now I'm not so sure. Was basically income redistribution and it enabled well-to-do people to keep their houses on the coast uh, because it simply redistributed money as they got flooded out. You get right. paid to build a new one. Well, and there's, and it's, you know, I mean, and it's, it wasn't priced as an insurance program in the lease. And the, the, of course, the other thing is, right? There's the explicit flood insurance. There's the fact is that even without flood insurance, we do go in and rebuild communities after they get destroyed by these. So there's sort of the explicit flood insurance program, and then there's the implicit guarant federal guarantee of reconstruction. And so, you know, and those are very hard things politically to to change. And you know, changing them will cause hardship for people. So you have to think about how you want to do that. But so, so one of the interesting features of that is that in the U.S. Of course, insurance is regulated by the states. Yeah. And so you get these anomalies. Um, for example, in New York, apparently the insurance commissioner was asleep at the switch, and so you are can actually cannot buy flood insurance um, for a lot of places on Long Island. The companies, the, the companies who are not actually acting in your, necessarily in your interest simply stopped writing policies once they determined that the probability of losses was too high. In Florida, um, what the insurance companies did was threaten to stop writing policies. The state government wouldn't let them, and the compromise that they reached is that the state indemnifies the companies. And so if they ever get unlucky and they get two, sto two bad storms in a hurricane season, the state is going to go broke uh, because their budget will simply not be able to withstand the, the losses. I think they can handle one, yeah. but two, they're going to be out of luck. So it, it, that's a really complicated uh, sort of political and economic landscape. Right. Well, and I think that, that points to the fact, right, I've been talking about sea level rise, but the other fact is that we have, you know, 
if you were a foresight, infinitely long-lived, you know, perfect foresight decision maker, you would not have built up the way we have built up now, even in the absence of sea level change. Right? So we, we, we're, we've left with these vulnerabilities, and somehow, you, as a society, we have to figure out how to reconcile these different interests. Well, I mean, I, I don't disagree with you, but without the trans waterborne transportation, we wouldn't have the country we have now. So I'm not sure that even knowing that, that would be the decision made when we didn't have the energy and the infrastructure. Right. So, Bob, on the, on the science side of it, yeah. um, so NOAA has just published um, a whole set of sea level rise scenarios. Yes. Um, how, do, how do those compare with what you guys have under, under review right now? Um, so the NOAA range goes from basically at the bottom end a linear continuation of current trends to a, a high end that is sort of based on some of the literature, although not the most recent literature, on the maximum physically possible in the century. So if you were actually going to the maximum physically possible, you would be more, you know, they have something like 2 meters in the century, you'd be more like 2.4 meters. Mm -hmm. That corresponds in our projections to, um, you know, something between the 99.5th and 99.9th percentile. So, so we, we sort of, if you look at our paper, which I'm happy to share on, I mean, the, the range we quote, we try to, you know, pick the upper quantile to be one that sort of corresponds with these projections of, of, of sort of maximum plausibility. But I would say basically, the um, lowest NOAA projection is basically, we would say, is close to zero probability. And the highest NOAA projection is close to 99.8% or 7% right. probability. OK, so, it's, so it's a, it spans a similar range. Right. So okay. the, I, think in, in, you know, I think one of the challenges is in many decision contexts, you actually want somehow to, quanti you know, to quantify the risk. So that's, right. what, that's what we're trying right. to do here. Right. Let's. So, so Bob. Uh, Bob do you think in terms of land use planning, economic planning, and uh, your other and democratic processes, that there's going to be a lot of development of those areas, jobs in those areas, people are going to go into it, there'll be much more of concern as we move to the future? In terms of, of the decision making yes. processes? It, I mean, is that an industry it, it, just it, like it, you got in climate change before it was popular? Oh, I, uh, I are people going to get it. into these? Um, well, I, I mean, I think a lot of them are probably, you know, it's hard to say there's going to be more people going into, say, pricing risk than is now. That's sort of a, you know, the dominant industry, in, at least in, in New York area. Um, the, uh, I don't know, but whether there's going, well, right. So the question is whether do I think like the finance industry and insurance companies are going to care more about climate risk? Yeah, I think. And if you look at the reinsurers, a lot of them do. Um, you know, the the insurers who sell you your insurance contract probably don't very much, but the ones who are insuring them have invested quite a bit in cli in climate research. Um, technocratically, well, at the federal level, we have things like the social cost of carbon now that goes into regulatory impact analyses. So that's a way that benefit cost analysis of regulation is starting to incorporate climate change impacts. Um, you know, I would certainly think that you know, if you're a land use planner, um, certainly at, at, at uh, Boston School, we try to make sure that you know, some of the people that Boston School are trying to understand sort of climate change and climate impacts. And then our planning school, we have a lot of work going on in this area. Um, and I know our planners you know, also are, are, are trained in sort of the democratic you know, running community deliberative processes. You know, I think whether you think that's an expanding area probably depends upon your projections of institutional change in this country as much as anything else. But um, right, but but any of these processes don't inevitably lead to a decision that of a retreat from the shore. Yeah. I don't. Right? Know. I mean, that's that because there is so much already invested. Mm -hmm. um, in in most places, that's not in fact a realistic option. Right. No, I, I mean, I, so it's I, all a matter of whether you're whether the state is self-insured or whether there is some way, some reserve that you have for rebuilding after the you right. know, although, inevitable although, right, bad the, thing I mean, happens. You know, if you think about you know the people in the quote unquote one in a hundred year flood zone where we have in a, you know twenty to whatever they say twenty to thirty expected floods in the course of a, a century, 
um, you know, if you're if you're if you're certainly if you're pricing your insurance or you're pricing you're, you're in Boston, you're pricing your rebuilding assistance based on the assumption that's a one in a hundred year flood zone, uh, you're going to get bank be bankrupt very quickly. Right. Um, so somehow, you know, that I think you know that the the the, the the fact of, of the sea level rise is going to be colliding against these political pressures and how... Right. You know, so, it, one, but so one of the things that's really tricky then are places like Miami. Yeah. I was talking to people about this a couple of weeks ago at a conference and mm -hmm. I mean Miami's right now where you get you know sort of an ordinary storm mm -hmm. uh, and, you're, and you're sort of knee deep in water in South Beach and uh, I mean the whole state's nothing more than a big limestone outcrop so it's not just storm surge is percolating right. up from below. Right. And well, I mean, what are they supposed to do? Well, I mean, so Miami's I mean, not going right, away. Right, so the you ocean look at, look at say, models like, like Venice, you learn to live with the flooding, right? So say in southern Manhattan, we could build big seawalls, or we could say that the, you know, the first story and a half, you just have to you make, you know, don't put the, stops, the shops on the first floor, do you know, elevated walkways and make the first story and a half things that are, it's okay if it floods. Um, you know, I think you know you're not going to evacuate Southern Manhattan, um, so you you want to you know and you know you may want to just build a seawall and act as though you know that that fixes a problem. But of course, you know if you act, build a seawall, that actually encourages further development near the seawall. So if that seawall fails because you get a, a freak storm or because you know time doesn't stop in 2100 and you just built your seawall to 2100, um, you know you you run into trouble. So what you want to do is is have approaches that are resilient to occasional flooding in my case. And in some cases that may mean, you know, you actually, you know, there are places as I said, in like Staten Island and Long Island where buyouts are, are plausible, or in the Jersey Shore where buyouts are a plausible option. Yeah. I noticed that some British architects designed houses that could float. So if the, if yeah. the, the flood rises, they just rise with it up to, up to a certain level. They're anchored to a pole. But I noticed that that, that uh, example you gave of the house sticking up on stilts Typically, when you have a storm, it's going to under, it's going to eat away the the, the foundation. Even yeah, well, that's that's a, you know, that's a, I mean, so the I problem with of all of like you know, Atlantic City has skyscrapers, but ultimately, they, you know, they, they have to burrow down to bedrock, and you know, it's it's very complex. You know, that's a problem building on sand. Yeah. Are there a lot of architects working on this problem and aware of this, these um, this information that you've been? I mean, I, you know, we, my, my my collaborators at Princeton are part of a. Um, Oh shoot! Who's flood? flood uh, DHS funded study that um, includes you know, some of the stuff the folks at Princeton and landscape architecture. So there are there are people thinking about it. Um, you know, probably are enough people thinking about it? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just I agree with everything you're saying, but as far as the impractical side, I might even be a little more cynical about it. I think that the wealthy and whatever who live in these waterfront areas have the economic means to influence democracy by, but, well, I call it buying off politicians, but that's, um, and then as far as the, the technocratic stuff, it all makes sense, but I could see them fighting that stuff tooth and nail, and when you're up against trying to fight these wealthy people, good luck with armies of lawyers, good luck fighting these people. I, I have no that any of this will get done on any level because of the way things until political reform something else happens in the country. Actually, I mean that's you know that that's that's a, an assessment of our adaptive capacity as a country based on our in current institutional structure and you know we may not have the adaptive capacity to, to follow right. these approaches. But but, the, but there are there are um, there are already examples where. Um, you know, sort of sensible decisions have been made. Boston's actually famous for building Deer Island about three feet, when it was all redone, what, 20 years ago, it's about three feet higher than the original plans. So the marginal cost, and so actually Paul Kirshen did all the, uh, who you'll see, I guess, day after tomorrow, did all the calculations for that as a consultant. The marginal cost of building it three feet higher is practically zero compared to the overall scale of the project. If you gotta build, if you gotta build it anyway, you know, and, and already um, a number of the developers in the Boston waterfront um, are putting the electricals and mechanicals on the, on the roof rather than putting them in the basement. Well, I mean, I but at some level, I mean, what So there are some sensible decisions even in the face yeah, of this. I yeah. just one about Florida that answers another question. They, they pile drive those piles yeah. 80, 90 feet down yeah, the bedrock they before City. they put the 
uh, yeah, houses on them. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, they're they're down they, pretty far. That's what they do at Atlantic City as well. Well, at least for I don't I don't know if they do it for the average home, but they you know for this, like skyscrapers in Atlantic City, they certainly do. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, but at some level, you know, I think what you're what you're probably seeing in New Jersey as a result of the rebuilding is gentrification of the shore, right? I mean, it just, you know, the the rich can afford to make investments in right. more resilient structures, and people who can't afford to are relocating. Yeah. 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 Do seismic events or volcanic events have much of an impact on sea level? Like if uh, uh, a volcano erupts and knocks knocks a mountain into the ocean, raises raises the ocean. Or if something happens underwater, do those? Well, so globally, no, but locally, yes. Um, you know, if you look, if you look at right, tsunami, well, tsunamis. But like, if you look at the tide gauges in Japan, you know, you know, in the in the East Coast, you can sort of look and see sort of these smooth background trends. If you look at tide gauges in Japan, the background trend is a whole, is in a whole lot of jumps, and you know, it's actually really hard to estimate what the actual long term average is um, just from the tide gauge record because. You know, the local sea level is very sub, you know, the land, the land moves, you know, a few centimeters. Well, the sea level has moved a few centimeters. Okay. Um, uh, it's almost quarter or two. Bob, you've been uh, very generous with your time. I'd like to thank everybody, uh, and we'll adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.